and he's got to give it out two and three. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Marblehead Yacht Club. Uh, my name is Marcel Niefenecker. I am the Commodore here at the club, and uh, in the name of the bridge, I would like to welcome everybody to our club for the third presentation in our winter series. Uh, quick advertising, we have one more to go uh, on April 10. We are switching gears a little bit to sailing, and we have uh, Chad Smith, come here to present some racing tactics and some sail trim and get all the sailors ready for some racing here. So with that, I would like to introduce Roger Tuvison, which will introduce the speakers. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I've got a unique experience this evening because a former student has become a teacher and a former teacher has become a student. I had Scott and at the middle school or junior high school back in the 70s and uh, we've been pretty friendly once I knew he could uh, catch a few fish. <laughs> I would like to show you a couple of books and I showed this to Scott and he immediately took a photograph of the book. The title of it is Seasons of the Striper and it's a current book. It's absolutely jam-packed with uh, Ideas about catching stripers, and it's got beautiful photography in it. So the title of it is Seasons of the Striper. We also have, in fact, we have a few for sale. Marblehead Yacht Club just published a history of the club and a short history of the shipyard area in this part of the harbor. So we have a few more copies. They're $25 each. Alan Peterson has them, if anybody would like one of these. There's a lot of stories in here about fishing 
And we have some pretty good stuff in here about uh, the shipyard. And uh, Scott came in this evening and said, boy, you guys did a good job with this book. So if Scott likes it, maybe some of you will like it. <laughs> the third book I'd like to tell you about, I, I read about it on, uh, in the magazine On the Water. And it's written by Michael Tugas and a friend of his named uh, Adam Gamble. And the title of it is The Power of Positive Fishing. And it sounds great. I don't have it. I want to get it. But the power of positive fishing. But the thing is that the whole thesis of this book is the two friends fishing together, seeking stripers. And Scott told me yesterday that he had had Michael Tugas uh, out fishing with him. Anybody know Michael Tugas? He's written many, many survival books. Tremendous, tremendous author. And he's local. I'm honored and privileged to introduce Scott tonight. Um, it's been great knowing him. He, we, we see each other out in the water. Usually he has the fish, I don't. Usually I'm asking the questions, but uh, we've, we've chatted for years, and uh, one time this summer I was by his boat and I said, Scott, would you like to speak uh, at the Marblehead Yacht Club uh, in the winter series? And, and uh, thankfully he said, sure, I'd love to do that. Um, Scott earned his uh, Coast Guard certification in 1978. He began his charter fishing in the late 70s, fishing for giant bluefin and bluefish on his dad's 40-foot sport fishing boat named Bluefish. During his 40-year working career, he would always find time to fish and take a few charters as well as participate in local fishing tournaments in which he, he has done very well. Since his 2021 retirement, he now spends most days fishing or chartering his current boat, a 27-foot south port named Keeper, is a familiar sight in and around the shores of Marblehead. He also enjoys fishing, chartering, and crabbing with his wife, Kathy, in Isla Mirada, Florida. And uh, anyway, without further ado, Captain Scott Edwards. Well, thank you, Roger, for those kind words. and. Um, you're too modest. I learned a lot from you back in the day. Um, and Commodore, thank you for uh, for hosting the, the speech. So um, I want to start out. This is uh, two minutes uh, just to get you pumped up, right? <laughs> so this is obviously the Boston Yacht Club in probably early July. 2013, my son bought a GoPro the day before, so this is this is day one of a GoPro, which I had no idea what it was, but look, look how we did. Um, I don't know why this, this should be sound. That's a Sabiki rig. We'll talk about this, but this is the key to catching bass in Marblehead, right there, those guys. So, that's the old boat, that's the Mako. You guys, some of you will probably remember that boat. I, was, I had that boat for 25 years. So these are underwater shots with the GoPro and these snorkeling. That's my son right there. That was JCC Cove, we'll talk about that. That's Ram Island right there. I didn't do these captions, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, this is early GoPro. It's pretty good, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So these are conventional rods. Where this trip, we were bump trolling. You can see the egg sinker on the line there. I'll, I'll talk about that. Um. <laughs> but that's uh, that's Ram Island right there, and these guys aren't scared of uh, 
scared them much. You can get you can get up close to them with a snorkel. And I, when I scuba dived, um, you could get right up to them too. They don't have a lot of predators. So let me get out of this. Oh, hang on, guys. This is the hardest part for me. Saver. <laughs> That's a deep water striper. We'll talk about those guys. All right. Now I want a full screen, right? Oh, where am I going? X that out, right? Anything now. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to talk about uh, striped bass fishing in the North Shore. I think you guys are going to have a lot of questions. Um, I ran a dry run yesterday, and I, why don't we go through the presentation? Because some of the questions will be answered as we go through the presentation. And at the end, I'll answer all the questions. So if you have questions, try to remember them, and then I'll circle back. Um, the questions are great. I want I want questions. Um, but let me go through it, and then we can always go back to the slides too. So these are all 2023 fish. These are clients, uh, with the exception of the bottom. That's my daughter. Um, so 2023 was uh, was a pretty good year for striper fishing. Better than 2022, and you'll see I'll have some numbers up there. Um, I call it the fish that launched a thousand center consoles. <laughs> so, uh, and you see it in the harbor, right? You guys see it in the harbor. And now power boats outnumber sailboats in Marblehead Harbor. And these guys are part of the reason. Um, some of it is some of us are getting older and don't like to sail sailboats. Um, so let's talk about the striped bass management uh, of the bass. So this year, it's going to be a slot, slot fish to retain one. Recreational is going to be 28. And the wording is less than 31. Somebody asked me, well, what if it's 31? I said, well, if it's 31, it's a keeper. So, <laughs> But I wouldn't keep one over 31. Um, they're doing that for a specific reason that I'll get into in the next couple slides. Uh, the commercial fishery in the state of Mass Commonwealth is going to be a little over 680,000 pounds. Uh, they're going to be over 35 inches. That's a decrease from last year of 7%. Um, and then a rule for four higher, uh, charter captains. You can fillet for your customers, but you're going to retain the rack, the body, to prove that it was a legal fish. That's a, that's a change this year. Um, so this is an interesting slide. It gives you a um, weight, age, length chart. And over here is Maryland. So Maryland in the Chesapeake Bay, they monitor the spawning of the, of the bass. And you can see the light blue lines here indicate um, the index goes up to 60, so the best year ever for spawning was 1996. So in 2013, when you saw that video, those fish were uh, 17 years old, right? So there were some fish kicking around back then that were uh, 49 inches long. And we caught some 49 inch long fish back then. Um, but you can see, the mean here, the black line, and the spawning for the last five years has been pretty bad, pretty low. Now, I'll get into kind of the reasons why. 
but uh, what they're trying to do with the regulations is protect these guys right here, the 20, 2015 fish. That was a big class of fish. So those fish in 2015 are now nine years old. So they're 33 to 34 inches. So they're out of the slot. So those are the breeders they're trying to protect. And I think they're doing the right thing. So this year, I think you guys are gonna have an opportunity to catch a lot of fish, 33 to 34 inches, 13 and 19 pounds. There's also a class of fish in 2011. These guys right there, they'll be 13 years old, 40 inches. If I'm holding this wrong, sorry, Commodore. <laughs> he told me how to hold the microphone and I'm doing it all wrong. Anyway, um, so 40 and 41 inches, 13 year old fish. So those are the 20 to 30 pounders. And they were around last year and they're gonna be around this year. So I, I think the fishing's gonna be good this summer. A uh, uh, guest asked me about when you think it's gonna start and I'll talk about that in the presentation. But it's sun angle and water temperature that determines when they, when they get here. Um, so here's some statistics about the recreational commercial fishery. Um, so in, 19, in 2022, the last time they, that I could find records, there were 6.8 fish taken, harvested, coastwise. You know, the whole coast, not just Massachusetts. Big increase over 2021. Attributable to, I think, that class of 2015 fish were now slot fish. And back then it was up to 35 inches, too. So there were a lot of fish taken. Recreational removals slash harvests account for 90% of the fish taken out of the ocean. So it's not the commercial fishermen that are the big reason um, a decline, if there's a decline in the spawning. Uh, fish. It's not. It's it's us. It's the it's the recreational fishermen. So the annual recreational harvest you can see by millions of fish. Back in the heyday, 4.6 million a year. 2004 to 2014. Then we started to see a drop. 2.8, 1.7, 1.8. Last year, a big increase. That class of 2015 fish were in the slot limit and they were being taken. Um, now releases, there's almost 30 million fish released by recreational anglers, coastwise. 9% of those are assumed to die. My brother says that's low. It could be. I mean, my experience is, yeah, maybe one out of 10 dies that I release and I'm really careful and I know how to release them. I know how to revive them. Not everybody does. I see people just throwing them overboard, you know, not even or ripping the hook out and throwing them overboard. So that's almost as many fish as is, is harvested, right? Um, yeah, there were 3.7 taken last year and 2.7 probably died, maybe more. Um, Commercial landings average about 1.4 million. That's not, I should have had the number of fish. Yeah, I do, 600,000 fish. And the Chesapeake Bay is where the majority of the fish are taken. 80% of the commercial fishery is in the bay itself. Now I didn't know this. I thought Massachusetts would be higher, but if you look at fish harvested, New Jersey, 33%, New York, 26, Maryland, 19, and Mass is 14. I thought Mass would have been higher. But the one thing we have is we have fish all season. We're in New Jersey and New York, they're more migratory, so they're getting them on the way up and on the way back. Whereas we can catch fish in July, August, September. Um, so here, this is just a, a chart of what we were talking about. So the red line is the commercial fish taken. Uh, the light blue is 
recreational fish harvested, and then the darker blue is the fish um, assumed to die after they're released. And you can see 20, 2022, the big increase in the harvest. Look at way, way back in the heyday, like 2006, look how many fish were taken. Um, this is the, is pretty, this is a great slide. It shows the, 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 the light blue shade is the stalking biomass, uh, the spawning biomass. So those are the spawners. So the 2015 fish are right here. Look at their, the spawning biomass is up there. That's good. They want to get it up to this blue line here and they'd really like to get it up to the, so that's what they're trying to do to get that light blue. Recruitment is the fish that they measure that survive in the spawning areas. So you really want the recruitment to be higher than it has been the last few years. Um, all right, let's talk about the fun part. Let's how to catch them, right? So uh, when you go striped bass fishing, there's a bunch of things to think about um, when you plan a trip. And if you have a plan, you're gonna be more successful. You just, you know, you gotta think about it. A lot of fish are caught the day before when you're preparing to, to go and get your tackle ready and the boat ready. Um, weather, of course, is important. That will determine where you can fish and where you uh, may not be able to fish. Tide cycle, super important for bass fishing. Um, bass like moving water, so they want uh, slack tide's no good, either end, low tide or high tide. Try to avoid slack. Um, around here, I like high tide the best, and the best fishing is probably one hour before high tide and one hour after high tide. And I'll plan my charters based on the tide cycle. I mean, if it's going to be low tide at 7 a.m., I'll tell my charters to show up at eight because it's not used, it's not worth it going at seven because we'll have a, an hour and a half of inactivity. Um, latest reports intel. So talk to your buddies that fish, super important. Figure out what happened the day before, or the couple days before. Uh, time of day, fast like low light. So, First light is great, dusk is great, cloud cover is good, <laughs> but they like low light and they'll, they'll feed better uh, early. Time of year, we're gonna go to the presentation, I'll talk about tactics for this time of year, spring, summer, fall, and the tactics will change a little bit because the patterns of the fish change. They're different when they first arrive and when they leave how to catch them changes a little bit. Water temp, 55 degrees is the magic number. You can catch them at like the low 50s, but when it turns 55, that's a pretty good indication that they're gonna be around. Boston Bee Buoy is the great source, that's where I go, right? Go to the Boston Bee Buoy and get the, get the temperature. Bait availability, really important. 90% of the fish I catch are on bait. Ogies, mackerel, pollock. If you can't get mackerel and you can't get pogies, go get pollock. They work. And you gotta think about your tackle. So these are the things that go into, you know, kind of thinking about a, a bass trip. Um, all right, bait. Go early. Mackerel are much easier to catch at sunrise. Seven o'clock, eight o'clock, you're too late. So you gotta go early. Sabiki rigs, this is a, this is a Chinese ripoff that I buy, they're like two bucks. <laughs> um, I think I have them right here. Amazon. You don't have to pay six bucks for these. You can get like these, a 30 of these for 
whatever. Maybe they're a dollar a piece, but um, these are great. Um, I just put a little teardrop sinker on the bottom. I don't even put a lure because if you put a lure on the bottom and you drop your sabiki rig to the bottom, you're going to catch a lobster trawl, lobster <laughs> trap. You're going to lose your sabiki rig. So I just use weights and just a weight to keep it vertical. With scoping out, put a heavier weight on because you have much better success when your sabiki rig is vertical. Chum, chum's really effective. Um, Steve Volpe, he's the master. He's the, he, he catches more bait than anybody. He even makes his own chum, and he puts glitter in the chum too. He didn't want me to say that, but he does. He puts glitter in the chum. So he uses ground up herring. Um, I use pogies, mackerel, herring. I have a big food processor, an industrial food processor. I cut the heads off because they don't grind up too well. But make your own, you can make your own chum. Unlike Florida, where you can buy chum in the supermarket in Florida, which is awesome. Um, you can't buy it in the supermarket here. Um, lobster shells work pretty good too. Cat food, cans of cat food. If you're desperate, just put cans of cat food in your boat. Um, bait fishing, if you have buddies out there, that's, that's really helpful to be able to get on the radio and talk to somebody that's already on them. And if they're on them and they're chumming and they're friends of yours and you can tie off off their boat, it's even better. Um, tide affects macro bait fishing as well. Slack tide's no bueno for bait fishing. So sometimes you have to wait. If you're there, slack tide, you just have to wait. They'll show up. Um, you know, Sabiki rigs, nothing fancy, uh, and I have the most success going to the mouth of the harbor right before sunrise, grabbing one of those outer moorings and start chumming and just wait for them to come to me. If that doesn't work, I'll start trolling try to find them slow trolling and then I'll stop and then I'll chum. Um, I'll talk about the spots too, but the mouth of the harbor is fine. Uh, Marblehead Harbor had a lot of mackerel in it at the end of the season this year. A lot. You probably were getting them right off the dock right here. Um, uh, another important thing is, of course, the boat. I, I didn't even put the boat here, but Center consoles are great. Um, to catch bass around here in the summer, you need to get close to the rocks. So having a small center console helps a lot. There are some guys that fish big down east boats, 35 feet, and they still do pretty well, but they're not in the rocks, generally. <laughs> so, um, VHF radio is probably the number one uh, electronics. Uh, I, I rate that higher than the sonar. You don't have to talk either. You just have to listen. Fishermen can't help themselves. <laughs> if they're having success, they're going to talk about it. What channel? I scan them all. I have two VHFs. So I scan all the channels so you can, you can hear them. Um, Mobile phone's great for talking to your buddies because you want to avoid broadcasting over the radio. So you call your buddies on the cell phone. Uh, sonar, so here's a picture. These are striped bass, 63 degrees. So I bet that's probably June. Yeah, mid-June, late June. That's Tinker's Island. That's Roaring Bull right there. And there's the boat. So I found those guys just cruising along. Uh, locations. Um, these guys are ambush predators. Um, they, they like structure. Rocks, reefs, coves, sandbars. We have all that here. 
We have all these islands out in Salem Sound. Uh, the fishing along the shoreline is is great from Nahant all the way to Gloucester. Um, the harbors and bays, if you find bait, you can catch fish out in the open. When I say open, like the bait is the structure, right? They're, like if you're fishing the hot bay, it's just a big bay of sand, right? But if there's bait in there, that's the structure that the fish are gonna be on that bait. So you need to find the bait. And it could be as easy as just looking at your fish finder, cruising them along, finding a few birds, but prospecting your trolling, we'll talk about that. That's how you find them. I started fishing in Broad Sound, Lynn Harbor. That's pretty pretty good. That was kind of new to me in the last couple of years. Boston Harbor can be really good. It's combat fishing in there though. <laughs> it's it's tough. Chuck, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, Boston Harbor has a lot of pogies, or can have a lot of pogies, and there's no fishing etiquette in there, so it's a little bit. It's it's a tough place to fish. Um, a better place to fish in the spring is in the deep water. Um, two spots that I, I like. The 140 foot line off Halfway Rock. So if you go out to Halfway Rock and you go southeast until you get to 140 feet and troll out there, I think the bass are following the mackerel and they're cutting across Mass Bay. So they're coming through the canal, up the south shore, they're gonna go around Cape Ann, and they're, for some reason they seem to be on that 140 contour. So this is, this is early June. Fiji buoy nearby humps. Fiji buoy is a um, buoy outside Boston Harbor, just outside the North Channel. Um, and there's a bunch of humps out there that you'll see in the chart. I'll show you on the chart. Um, that's a good early season spot as well. So this is just a close up of kind of the, the local fishing spots. I've had great success, and every year is different. These spots change every year. Um, but historically, for the local guys, the back side of the neck here is kind of the money spot. Um, Tom Moore's Rocks right there, in the reef here. This point right here is like where a lot of the fly guys catch their fish. The coves on either side of Tinkers are great. The south side of Tinkers is good. And all along here is good. Where the surf break is off Devereux, that's a really good spot too. And then all these coves, all the way down to Galoops are good. And Ram Island can be, can be good. Historically, it's been great. It's not as good as it used to be. The outer, outer picks, forget it. That's, there's 100 seals out there. That used to be good, not anymore. Um, so here's, here's Broad Sound, right here, and you can find fish anywhere inside of, well, they're outside Egg Rock too, but this can be really good. And then I started fishing up here in, in Lynn Harbor, and there's like flats fishing here. At high tide, there's not enough water to get there at low tide, but at high tide you can catch them. And this is where I took. Michael Tugas fishing. And it was like flats fishing. He was just throwing like sluggos and getting them on sluggos in four feet of water right here. Um, and then this of course is Boston Harbor. And you'll see where their fish are being caught when you go into Boston Harbor. You can't miss it. Because uh, the boats will be everywhere. Um, so what's the best way to catch them? Live bait. Live bait. Um, chumming and fishing cut bait, probably number two. Sometimes number one, because sometimes they'll pass up a live one, but they'll eat a chunk. So you got to kind of figure out what they want. 
Um, by far the most fun way to catch striped bass is top water lures. Um, and it especially works well out in the deep water when they're chasing sea herring and mackerel and you can actually see the fish and you throw a pencil popper or, or a, a dock. This is, this is a dock right here. That's a, it's a freshwater musky lure. And it, when you pull it back, it kind of goes like this and it looks like a wounded bait fish on the surface. For some reason, stripers love these things. These, these will outfish bait sometimes. Um, that's a, it's a really good lure. Um, trolling, especially early season, is a great way to find fish. Um, and then once you find them, you can jig them. Slow pitch jigs, paddle tails, flutter spoons. I'll get into that. Um, and then in shallow water, um, in the wash around all around the rocks and marble head, you can catch them with flies. I don't fly fish a lot, some of my customers do. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys fly fish, but the fly fishing can be really good uh, around the rocks here in Marblehead and the North Shore. Um, all right, so the spring. Uh, the humps off Boston, the 140 line off southeast of Half High Rock. Look for bait and birds, look for other boats. Uh, start trolling. The Nomad DTX, which is this guy right here, is an awesome lure for trolling for striped bass. They're a big lip lure, they'll go, you know, get the one that goes deep. I mean, if you're out in 140 feet, you can troll the one that goes 30 feet down, because that's, that's where the fish are gonna be, they're gonna be down deep. This Carl catches a lot of fish on this lure right here, and they're always, they always seem to be big. It's a big lure. Um, I got a couple in here. Yeah, I took I took the trebles off, and it has like the single hooks, which are just a, just as effective, and it's much easier to release the fish. But you know, this one says it goes ten meters, so thirty three feet down. Great way to find bass out in the deep water. And Tomo showed me this, this guy, which I used in October in Salem Harbor, and that's like a pogey color. And this one goes 10 feet. So you control this in Salem Harbor. And this was working really well when they were on pogies in Salem Harbor, and you didn't even have to snag a pogey, you can just control this around and it, it worked really well. So thank Tomo for that. And if you guys don't know Tomo's shop, it's it's awesome over in Pickering Wharf. That's where you want to go to get your fishing stuff. Um, now live bait, you can, certainly there's mackerel out there, so jig some mackerel out when you're out deep. Get, get some mackerel in your live well and uh, just free line them or what I call bump trolling. So you're just moving slowly forward. You have the boat in gear. Sometimes you take it out of gear, but you're just kind of dragging that mackerel. And oftentimes, if it's free swimming and you're drifting, the bass may not <coughs> hone in on them because they got to chase them. But if you start trolling a little bit and that target is easier to get because that mackerel is being towed, you'll find that you might catch a fish. So sometimes when they're not hitting, you know, you're drifting and you see the bass, you see them in the machine, you see them near your bobber, but they're not hitting it, just start moving and trolling a little bit. I don't know if you're taking it away from them or it's just an easier target because the, the mackerel is straight. Um, and if you see bass out there, you're catching them, throw these guys. Um, it's so much fun. And then this Algag's paddle tail works great too. You can just cast it out, jig it, 
reel it back to the boat. Those are very effective too. Uh, summertime, <coughs> uh, summertime it's 90, for me it's 90 something percent bait. Both these guys, mackerel and uh, bogeys. Um, you want to be uptight to the rocks and islands. You want to look for structure. So a good thing to do around here is go not, not, go at low tide. You're not necessarily fishing. You're just scouting spots out. But you want to look for areas where you know bass are going to be hiding. So you want to look for the rocks. And you want to go back there at high tide and fish those rocks that you saw at low tide because that's where the fish are going to be around the structure. Um, so when you're fishing around structure, depending on the weather, the winds and so forth, and the current, I do all three of these. Um, I might start with a bump troll, which just means you're like nose hooking the bait. And you're putting the rod low to the water and you're going very slow around the structure. And Roger taught me that like 35 years ago. Ram Island, I remember. <laughs> and I remember the rock too. He says, the rock's right there. So that's a great way to find them. Just bump troll around the structure. And you can't be shy. That's, you know, that's why you gotta go at low tide so you know the ro where the rocks are. Because 10, 15 feet makes a difference between catching one and not catching one. Um, if there's no wind, go right up to the area where you want to fish, where the rocks are, drift, cast that, cast that live bait or that chunk right to where the rock is and hopefully you'll hook up. Uh, I anchor when I'm charter fishing a lot because I'm by myself and I got three people fishing. So I'm driving the boat and trying to keep track of it. So I just anchor and try to get close to where I think the fish are so I can reach them with a cast. Um, fresh dead sometimes outfishes live, especially if the water's warmer because the fish are there. They can be lazy. They're kind of like Labrador retrievers. They are. They just, they'll eat anything. Um, they're, you know, I've seen them. I've seen them roll over rocks with their noses and eat crabs. I've actually seen that. And a lot of times in the summer, if there's no pogies or mackerel are around, these guys are up tight and they're eating lobsters and crabs. That's what they're eating. So if you can throw a mackerel in front of them when they're eating lobsters and crabs, you're, you're in good shape. They're, gonna, they're not gonna turn down a mackerel. Um, tide, time and tide are important. If you can get high tide, either side of high combined with low light. So, my, you know, 5 a.m. high tide and then you're fishing at six, that's perfect. Now hopefully you already got your mackerel. And that's positive fishing, right? When you got a live bait well full of mackerel, that's positive fishing. So, um, fall's a little different. Um, the fish are on the move. They may not be in the rocks. They may be out in the open. So you wanna try to locate the bait and the birds. Um, in the fall, we get these peanut bunker, which are just juvenile bunker. There's one right there. It's, that was regurgitated by a striper that's four inches long. These are peanut bunker right here. This is probably Marblehead Harbor. Um, could be Salem Harbor, but it looks, I, don't, I can't tell you. It's deep, yeah, that's Marblehead. Um, so there's the peanut bunker, and look at all these guys. These are all big bass right here. Um, so a new way to catch them that I, Ricky Kuzner is pretty good at doing this and some other guys, I, I'm not that good at it, but this flutter spoon, 
and just draw, you know, you mark the bat. If you're marking these bats right here, drop one of these flutter spoons down. It looks like a wounded pogey. This guy right here. You just drop it and it just wobbles down. You pull it up and it wobbles down. This is pretty effective for catching stripers. Um, the SP Minnow, so they're on the little, little pogies. So this guy works great. So in the fall, you can catch them with lures easier than the summer. Um, so this is a great little lure. It's called an SP Minnow. And of course, the paddle tails are always good too. I think I have one here. This little paddle tail. These work good too. Um, but they won't pass up a live bait. If you got live bait, use them. Um, the fall time and tide a little less important. I mean, you can catch stripers in the fall in the middle of the day because um, they're just moving and they're chasing bait. But you know, early is still the preferred time to fish. But you want to go fishing when you can. That's the best time, <laughs> right? You go fishing when you can. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about tackle. I have uh, a couple of rods set up here that I'll show you guys. Uh, spinning reel is the most common, uh, 4,000 to 5,000. That's the size of the spinning reel. That's all you need to catch stripers around here. You can catch a big striper on a, on a 4,000, 5,000 class spinning reel. Conventional star and lever drag reels, this guy here. Better reel for trolling. Better reel for bump trolling. Um, trolling the big lip uh, lures. Certainly can use a spinning rod, a lot of guys do. Um, but I prefer the, the conventional for trolling. Uh, braided line, 20 to 30 pounds. You don't need 50 pounds on your reels for striper. In fact, charter fishing now on my, I'll show you the rod in a second, I'm fishing 15 pound braid. Cast better, cast further, plenty strong. Um, and then the leaders, mono or fluorocarbon, I go back and forth. Sometimes when I'm not catching them, I go to fluorocarbon. When I'm catching them good, I go to mono. Fluorocarbon's expensive. Um, I'm not convinced the fluorocarbon is the answer, but then when I'm not catching them, I, I use fluorocarbon, so. Uh, all right, this is, this is probably the, you know, the most important thing for us to, to protect the fishery is to take care of the fish when we catch them, right? So, barbless hooks, I mean, if you're really into them, squeeze the barbs on your lures or if you're fishing bait, squeeze the barbs. If you already harvested the fish, you're just fishing for fun, you know, squeeze the barbs because you can get the hook out a lot easier, a lot less trauma to the fish. Um, lures, you can take off the treble hooks and put on single hooks. It's safer for you too. Um, I have taken treble hooks out of people's hands and the tool that you want for that, and I don't think I brought it, but there are bolt cutters. <laughs> I have bolt cutters on my boat. And I've had people come up to me with lures in their hand, and I've taken them out with the bolt cutters. Um, so yeah, single hooks if you, if you swap out your treble hooks. Um, if you're fishing live bait, or cut bait, the, the, the law is you have to use circle hooks. Um, now circle hooks you want to match the size of the bait. So the hook needs to match the size of the bait, not the size of the striper you want to catch, but the size of the bait. Because what can happen if you use too small, a, you have too big a bait and too small a circle hook, that circle hook is going to get caught into the bait. So you need a, on a bigger bait, you need a larger gap on the circle hook. 
I think this is a number six circle hook. If you're fishing like a big pogey, probably a number eight or a number nine circle hook. And if you're really into it, you can bridle it. Um, but when you're bump trolling a, a fish, you want to hook it in the nose so it trolls straight. If you're drifting, sometimes I hook them by the dorsal fin. And if I want them to go down deep, I'll hook them towards the back so the mackerel will swim down deep. Um, yeah, if you're snagging pogies, uh, <laughs> the bass will obviously hit a snag pogey. <laughs> the right thing to do is bring the pogey into the boat and switch it over to that circle hook. Um, some people take their time reeling the snack pokies back. Um, I mean, it works, um, but to save the fish, it'd be better if you brought it back and put a circle hook on it. Um, you don't want to use too small a gear. You want to get that fish in. Um, so don't use like a little freshwater rod because you're just going to wear the fish out. Um, Everybody likes a picture, take the picture, but don't hold, don't keep it out of the water very long. Um, oop. You know, hold it horizontally, grip in the lower jaw, support the weight, avoid touching the eyes and gills. If it's hooked really deep, don't bother to try to pull the hook out unless you have one of these. This is a Baker D hooker. This one is probably 10 years old. We have a couple of them on the boat. This is a great tool. You can go right down the throat, hook that hook on the shank. It will twist the hook around and you just pull it right out. So if you didn't nick the gills, that fish is gonna survive if you get that hook out. Um, Great, great tool. Um, and swim them, Re release them right, it says. So, you know, you want to hold them upright. You don't want them belly up. You want to hold them upright so the dorsal fin is up. Put the boat in gear. Hold the fish with a slower lip and gently try to revive it. And you'll know when he revives because he'll start kicking and then you can let him go. Um, on my boat, it's, it's, I'm kind of high off the water, so but sometimes what I do is I lip them on the bottom and then I tie a line to this and then tie a line to the spring cleat and swim them. Give them, you know, so now I'm not leaning over holding them the whole time. This part, that works pretty well. Um, okay. So some of the things you guys want to have in your boat is a bait dehooker. Try not to touch the mackerel. If you can hold them over your bait tank and unhook them with the bait dehooker, that's the best way to do it because you'll they'll last longer if you don't touch them. Um, fish grippers are these guys. These are great. I don't use a net typically. Uh, I just grab them by the lip, lift them up to dehook them. These are great. And these are good for swimming them too. You can use the same thing, tie a rope, leave this on the fish and just swim the fish. Um, you need a good pair of pliers. Get the hooks out. Um, landing net, landing nets work good. Carl uses a landing net on his boat because he's pretty high up and lifting the big fish into that. The main event, he needs a he needs a net. Um, and binoculars. So, Roger asked me. I think Roger you asked me a question yesterday about. So, say I'm at the mouth of the harbor and I'm bait fishing, catching mackerel, which is typically my routine. I, I catch the bait before the charter because I don't like to take my charters bait fishing. 
because it can be very stressful. It's a four hour charter and you don't catch bait in the first 90 minutes. <laughs> so I try to get the bait beforehand, either the day before and pen them or go out really early and get them early. But what I do now, and in, in, in Salem Sound, we had a bunch of pogies last year. Um, and if you go to the mouth of the harbor and you just take your binoculars and you go from Misery Island and just scan down Endicott, down the shore, Beverly, and look. Sometimes you can see the other boats, or you can see the bogey boats, more importantly. And then plans change, right? Instead of taking a right and going to the back side of the neck, I'll take a left and go over towards Salem Harbor. Because the bass are gonna be where the bait is. And if you find the bogeys, you should go investigate it. Um, so, this well, I'll just go through like the four months of uh, good striper fishing around here. So this, that's Chip Walcott. That is May 5th. That is on the humps off the BG buoy. Um, and that guy took a free swimming live mackerel. Um, and I think that fish was 48 inches long. This is a deep water fish. That's a May fish as well that Jenny caught. And that's, a, that's another deep water fish. So on the water has the little migration map. And you can see that in May 5th last year, the yellow is like 30 inch fish. And that's, that's accurate, that's accurate. But these guys are coming up too. They're following all the baits, so you can still catch really big bass out deep in May. This is probably the best time to fish in Marblehead, beginning of June right through 4th of July. It's when the big fish are here. You can see the red, so those are all, you know, 40 inch plus fish. That's a deep water fish in May. This one was hot, caught more over by Hull in Boston Harbor. And that guy was caught like two in the afternoon. So the time of day matters a little less when they're actively feeding on, on, um, on schools of bait. And June 30th, it's, uh, it's on, right? Party's on June 30th. Summer solstice to like the July 10th, those couple weeks, that's my favorite time to fish for stripers around here. And that, that guy right there, that's the back side of the neck. Um, there's Greg with a nice fish. I don't know where we are, Greg. It's probably, is that off Devro? Yeah. August. A little bit harder to catch them in August, but um, this this was Cat Island. Um, this this was probably over by the I think this was over by the Goose Ferries. Um, all bait. September things are starting to ramp up a little bit. There's Faxon with a Faxon's a really good fisherman, by the way. If you guys want to go fishing with a, a really good young fisherman, Faxon and Michelle is great. And there's my son, Billy. In October, this, this is Salem Harbor. Salem Harbor was lit up this October. You didn't have to go anywhere. Just go around the corner to Salem Harbor. There's Tomo uh, with a nice uh, Salem Harbor right in the mornings, Salem Harbor. I've caught fish a lot of fish on my mooring, by the way. I see Roger trolling by my mooring. <laughs> BYC dock's pretty good too. You're not supposed to fish there, but sometimes a fish like ends up in the water over there, a bait fish. Um, so that's it, guys. Um, so I can show you some tackle and we can answer questions. Um, getting bait ahead of time. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the 
them alive overnight, I kill the battery. Don't try to do that. <laughs> So, so, so the question, the question is, how do you keep bait overnight? Um, good question. So, yeah, you don't want to leave them in your live well because you will run your battery down, um, and they probably wouldn't make it in the live well anyway. So, you need a bait pen that you can tie off your mooring. Is that the thing because of the round? Yeah, you see them with the pool, the pool noodles around them, and yeah, they float. Um, the bigger, the better. I mean, I had a three-footer and now I have a really big one. The more room they have to swim around, the better. But if you're just gonna hold them overnight, you can get away with a smaller one. If you pen them, can you feed them to keep them, keep them going for a week or two? I think the answer is yes. Do you feed yours, Steve? You don't feed them? That's a Florida thing, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. We feed them in Florida. Yeah, yeah, Google eyes and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think you can feed Max. I never have them in there long enough. I usually recycle them pretty quick. Uh, but I think if you have a big bait pen, I think Brian uh, Danforth at the Dolphin Yard probably had a big bait pen. I think he would feed them. That's a, that's a good question. Can you say a little bit more about the mortality rate for recreational fishing and different methods and represent data about triple hooks, fly fishing, lures, treble hooks, etc. So so the question is about mortality and, and, and data about mortality and the type of hooks and so forth. So circle hooks are supposed to catch the fish in the latch in the in the in the, in the jaw. It's supposed to slide out of the throat and then catch on the way out. It, it, it does work, but you lose a lot of fish too. Circle hooks aren't good at hooking fish. Um, but I think the mortality is, is lower with circle hooks because they get caught in the lip. Um, fly fishing, I think you know that hook's pretty in, in, you know they're pretty small. But the, the danger with fly fishing is you fight the fish too long. So it's not the hook, it's that you exhaust the fish and then if you don't revive them, it could be problematic for the fish to, to survive. Um, so if you're fishing to release fish, I think the best thing you can do is push the barbs down, swap out the treble hooks for single hooks and be really you know, get the fish in. Don't don't fight it too long. Try to get it in. Roger. How long are you waiting after the fish hits your bait with the circle hook on? That's, so how long are you waiting to uh, with the circle hook when the fish hits the bait? When I'm charter fishing, I leave the rod in the rod holder and let the hook fish hook itself. And generally, that's the, that's the best way. The fish would just swim away with the, with the bait and hook itself. So, you know, with a circle hook, you don't need to set the hook. You don't need a big hook set like you see in the Bass Masters on TV. You don't need that. So, um, yeah, just, keep, just reel it tight. And the hook hopefully will get in there on its own. So, um, any other questions? Okay. Uh, does anyone ever throw cast nets on pogies? I haven't seen anybody do it successfully. <laughs> I've seen it. Um, I have a cast net. I'm not very good at throwing it. Um, I, it would have worked this year. I mean, there were situations where off the bow of my boat I could have scooped them up with a regular net. but. You know, the, sometimes the pogies are in 30 feet of water, so mm -hmm. that cast is not like Florida where it's three feet of water and that net pins them down to the bottom real quick. So I think Randy's done it a little bit. Um, yeah, that, I've often thought that'd be a great way to get a lot of pogies, but I've seen it done on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, let me show. Oh, 
Question in the back. Scott, how are you tying the braid to the uh, mono and the floral? John, great question. So how do I tie the braid to the leader? I use an Alberto knot. Um, I think I have the video. I, I, I'm a little bit technology challenged to go on YouTube. And, but if you YouTube Alberto knot, it will show you how to do it. And it's an easy knot to tie on the boat. It's a, you know, the knot that's going to work for you is the one that you can tie with confidence. Um, you know, there's like the FG knot, which is a which is a great knot. It's hard to tie. I have a hard time tying it on the boat. I do it the night before. That's more of a tuna fishing leader knot because um, it goes through the guides. I mean, the Alberta knot you can cast pretty easily. Um, but that's, yeah, that's a good question, John. Alberta knot. And, uh, and to tie the hooks on, I use a Palomar knot now. I don't use the, the classic fisherman's knot. The Palomar knot is, uh, is the knot to use. Um, and you can Google that. That's a really one, easy one to tie as well. So I'll show you some of the tackle um, that I use. So this is a Shimano Terramire 7, 6, 10 to 20 pound, half ounce to one and a half ounce, medium heavy, extra fast action with a Daiwa BG 4000, 15 pound braid, 25 pound, leader tied on with an Alberto knot. Put this down. So um, this is what I this is what most of my charter customers I hand them this rod. And what's great about this is that this is a six hot circuit hook. So I would probably nose hook a, a mackerel. You want the smaller mackerel. Generally, especially for a rod this size, you want you know a mackerel that big. Smaller is fine, like bass. I call it bass candy little ones. Um, and then I have the sliding, so you can cast this because you can see the bobber slides right. You don't have to worry about the bobber jamming up against the tip. But what's really cool is you put these little pins in the bobber. What happens is that pin hits that Alberto knot and stops. So there it is, three feet from the bobber. This one's a little short, usually I'll do four or five feet. But if you're fishing in six feet of water, perfect. You know, that, that mackerel is right there in the kill zone. So it's about four feet down. And um, it's, you know, easy fishing with customers that don't fish much and just throw it out and, and they hook, <coughs> they'll hook themselves with this hook. I just leave it in the rod holder. Um, a lot of times I hand the rod to the and, and they like to hold the rod, everybody likes to hold the rod. But when they see that barber go under and they pull it, it's like, oh, I shouldn't have pulled it. <laughs> but wait a little longer. Um, so that's, that's kind of the go-to rod um, that I use the most. Carl was asking me about this one. So this is a little heavier setup. Shimano Therese, 7 to 40 to 80, medium heavy, fast action. But this is a bait runner. So you can put this in the rod holder and this has a clutch to release. So when that bass hits, you won't feel much tension. You can just take it away. Um, bigger hook, I think that's an 8-0. Bigger bobber, same principle though. It will slide up to the knot. So this is for a pogey 
or a big mackerel. But the great thing about the bait runner is the, the fish will take off, he'll start, start running, you know, you'll hear that, and then you just pick the rod up and it engages. You don't have to worry about opening the bale. Um, it's a great, a great reel. So it's called the bait runner. Uh, this one is, is pretty big. This is an 8,000. You don't need one that big. A 6,000 would be plenty. Um, I mean, this one's, you can catch tarpon with this one. Um, so if I was only to get two rods, I'd get these two. A heavier spinning rod and a lighter spinning rod. Um, for trolling, this is an Avid um, MXL Star Drag. I, I like Star Drags a little better than the lever drags just because I can feel like I can control the drag a little better with the Star. And this is that little lure, like the little Kobe swimmer. This is this one says 16 feet, so this one goes a little bit deeper. But this is more like a set and forget it. I mean, just put it in the rod holder, get it out there, and just troll around, right? So, I mean, if you don't have time to catch bait or um, the bait is not around, use this guy. Works great. Um, and this is the most fun way to catch them, for me anyway. Passing. This is a seven inch, a seven inch dock. Walk the dog lure, it's on the surface and you reel it back and you put the right motion in the rod. It kind of wobbles back and forth. And there's a rattle in here too. Yeah. And I, they respond to that rattle. I think that's what brings them in. It'll bring them up from like 30 feet down. You'll hear it. They'll hear it. Um, and this is just, this is a 5,000 Daiwa spinning, spinning reel. Probably it's 20 pound braid. Feels like 25 um, mono leader. And I got a fast snap. I think they call them tactical. Tactical angler snap. So it gives a, it has a little dip to the lure. If you're going to tie it directly, use a loop knot because it gives the lure a little more action as opposed, as opposed to tying it straight to the, to the eye. You want a little action. But these little snaps, these tactical angler snaps are great because you can swap out lures quickly without having to retie. Um, and this rod is a, is a little longer. This is a, a, a 710, 15 to 30 pound. Right, so it gives you a little more distance when you're casting. And then another cool way to catch fish now that's relatively new is these slow pitch rods, which are really fun to fish with because they're light. Um, and this, this is a jigging rod, it's not for casting. But if you find the fish and you see them on the fish finder, just drop this down and it's just slow jigs. So if you if you want if you want to do this, go on online. You'll see it. Just Google slow pitch jigging, and it will show you. Uh, but you can fish all. I use this to catch um, cod and haddock bottom fishing too, because it's so much fun to fish because it's so light, and you can catch big fish on this rod. So you, this is really fun fun fishing. Me and I catch mackerel with this because it's just easy and light. So. I did. Uh, I brought some stuff to give away to you guys. Somebody came in and didn't get a ticket. Somebody? Does everybody have a ticket? <laughs> Somebody came in and did not get a ticket. Anybody?
ticket back in so there was one gal there that won four prizes. This was a big group of big fishermen. So we're not gonna do that. <laughs> Good move. Next number three three six four one zero eight. Next number, 336 How many do we have left, Scott? Uh, two more. Two more. Two Five more. Left there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did he say rods? Yeah. <laughs> no. I don't no. think so. No. Okay, last four digits. Four zero nine four. Four zero nine four. We have a winner? Yep. That's working perfect, huh? You did a good job, Roger, handing those out. Not yet. <laughs> you know, down at that seminar, Scott, they had the winners come up. They're getting some good exercise. This is full service. Okay. I guess last winning number, 4082. Four zero eight two. Why don't you come down? Come down this way a little bit. I'll hand it to you. Let me give him a couple. Uh, couple of stickers. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Hold on. No. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. 
Shore fishing. Um, braid is susceptible to wind knots that you get less of with mono. You don't cut your hands with the mono like you cut your hands with the braid. So easier to tie knots with mono. You That's why it stayed to, there. <laughs> you don't have to necessarily use a leader to fish with mono or tying a mono to mono leader connection is not hard at all. Uh, double uni knot. Yeah, yeah. If you like mono, stay with it. Absolutely. Yeah. We're saying uh, 55 degrees is like the optimal temperature. Right. But if you're measuring yourself, at what depth is that? So that's surface water. So the, the Boston D buoy is surface water, or, or your GPS is your transducer is like two feet down, so it's only two feet down. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the thermal client, it's a lot colder. You know, 30, 40 feet down is a lot colder. So Surface a couple feet down. Yeah, it's just a couple feet down. But, you know, the one thing that we're sure of is that we'll come back, and they'll be here sometime in May. <coughs> um, but where we catch them changes every year. Every year it changes. And the techniques change a little bit, too. And it's really dependent on the forage, the bait, where the bait is, and the amount of bait. So, yeah. Here's a question. Sure. We've had an extremely mild winter. Yes. We anticipate an earlier season this year. I looked at the buoy a week ago and it was 39 degrees, which yeah. is which is normal. Yeah. Normal. I think for us it feels because we haven't had any snow or anything. Wind direction helps. But the sun angle, I think, is the, is the main determinant of their migration. It's really the sun angle. Um, but that brings up another question as far as the spawning in the Chesapeake Bay. These warm winters are not good for that. And lack of rain and snowpack is not good either. So the zooplankton that the little fry feed upon yeah. Needs you know the right water, salinity, and, and a mix of fresh water and the right temperature. And that's why I think the spawning has been down because the environmental factors that go into it aren't all aligned. It's it's, it's uh, climate change. Part of it. Yeah. So, so correlating that with on the waters weekly forecast, what do Imagine they're reporting down in Ches Chesapeake now, right? They're probably spying. Steve, you probably know better than I, but they're, are they spying right now? Or is it a couple more weeks? I think a little bit, a little bit later. A little couple more weeks. Okay, one more question. Because I'd like to say congratulations to Scott yeah. And, yeah. and great honor to hear him <laughs> Yeah, I was fishing last summer.